in the second segment, we're going to start by talking about denaturation of proteins. So denaturation of proteins involves irreversible changes in a protein's um, folded shape. And this can occur both inside and outside of the body. So something like heating or cooking a food can denature protein. So an egg is a good example, as we can see in this picture here. So think about... Um, you know, the egg is liquidy when it's inside of the shell. You break it, you cook it, you add heat to it, and those proteins denature. Um, and this, you can't take a cooked egg and put it back into, um, you know, the raw egg and yolk. So you can't reverse um, a protein once it has already been denatured. Denaturation can also occur by radiation, um, alcohol, acids, bases, and salts of heavy metals. So with those acids, this is another one that would occur, or this would occur in the body, so through digestion. So stomach acid um, is very, very, very acidic, um, and it works to denature proteins, so the enzymes can then um, work for digestion of proteins. So this um, image down here shows, you know, a good example of what's, we have our normal protein, and then once it's denatured, it usually loses the biological activity. So um, the the structure of the protein has changed. Um, and like I said, generally this is irreversible. This is showing that it goes both ways. But in general, I just want you to think to know what denaturation is. So it's really the changing of um, the shape of the protein. Next, let's get into protein digestion and absorption. So protein um, digestion, there is no digestion in the mouth. So um, only carbohydrate and a little bit of fat digestion occur in the mouth. The stomach, however, is where protein digestion begins. So remember, there's no digestion of carbohydrate or fat in the stomach, but this is where protein digestion starts. So first, proteins are denatured by the acid, the stomach acid, and stomach pH um, is around 1.5. So the stomach is very, very, very acidic. Once proteins have um, been denatured, enzymes... Um, in the stomach are activated by the stomach acid and then this helps to um, further digest the proteins from food. Next those proteins are going to be um, transferred to the small intestine so remember in the stomach we have that liquidy substance called chyme so the chyme is then going to go into the small intestine and this is where pepsin which is the major protein enzyme um, will break down our polypeptides which remember that's 10 or more amino acids and we'll break those polypeptides into either single amino acids, dipeptides, or tripeptides. So pepsin is going to be your clue that this relates to protein. So amylase relates to carbohydrate or starch. Lipase re relates to lipids or fat. And then pepsin is going to be your protein. And pepsin is also going to be produced um, by the um, pancreas. So once the amino acids have been um, been released or um, broken down into those single amino acids in the small intestine, those amino acids and then some of the larger peptides that were not completely um, digested will be absorbed by the cells of the small intestine. Um, when they're absorbed and they're then transferred to the bloodstream for use by the body cells, um, those larger molecules or those larger peptides are not necessarily a good thing. So they may act as um, to stimulate the immune response. So this could be related to food allergies in some individuals. Um, so if someone has a milk allergy, there may be, um, you know, that doesn't completely break down. So this could be a clue for that. But these larger peptides may have some beneficial roles in possibly acting as hormones um, to help regulate body functions. And they can also provide the body with information about the external environment. So there's sort of some good and bad of these larger peptides, but it's really unclear what their, what their true role is. Um, the absorption sites in the small intestine are somewhat of a competition. So the same types of amino acids may compete for the same absorption sites. So basically, if you're cons over consuming a certain amino acid, it may compete um, with absorption of a similar um, type of amino acid. Once the amino acids have been absorbed, they're then released into the bloodstream where they'll be carried to the liver. And then um, at the liver, they're going to be used for their various roles in the body, which we'll talk about um, in the next couple of slides. They can also be used for energy when necessary. Again, protein is not a preferred energy source, but it can um, serve as an energy source when necessary. 
figure is from your book, and it does a really good job of describing the digestion absorption of protein. Um, so I would definitely recommend to check that out. Um, it's the same information as those previous two slides, just broken down into picture form. So why is protein important? Well, a continuous supply of amino acids is necessary for the body um, to help build new proteins and then repair old proteins in the body or worn out proteins. The body is in a constant state of protein turnover, which um, protein turnover is just defined as a process of um, continuous breakdown, recovery, and synthesis. Amino acids are needed each day, so you can't save up your amino acids or be like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to consume a lot and I'm not going to consume any today. Because protein is not stored in the body, um, it's really used as it comes in for its various roles. Um, and this is why um, a constant supply of amino acids, both essential um, and then our non-essential amino acids, are needed each day. Let's talk about some of the roles of protein. So, protein is a structural component of muscles, connected tissue, organs, and hemoglobin in the body. It's also a basic component of various enzymes, um, basically all enzymes actually in the body, um, different hormones, antibodies, and other biologically important chemicals. It helps to maintain and repair tissues in the body, so that kind of goes back to the structural component piece up here. It also helps to transport um, lipids, vitamins, minerals, and oxygen around the body. So hemoglobin, um, which we briefly touched on when we talked about sickle cell disease, so hemoglobin is actually a protein that's going to carry oxygen um, throughout the body. Protein is also very important in helping to maintain um, fluid and electrolyte balance, so too much fluid in the body can cause edema. Um, so protein is very important in helping to maintain that balance. It also helps to maintain the acid-base balance um, of the body. So too much acid, um, an individual will become acidotic. This can have negative health impl implications. And so um, can when um, an individual is has very high um, or is very basic or it goes into a state of alkalosis. Um, protein is also essential in helping are playing a role in blood clotting, and then again, it can serve as an energy source, but this is not preferred. So your book gives a whole lot more detail about each one of these roles, um, and really here I just gave you a very quick overview, so I definitely recommend um, reading the textbook about each of these roles of protein um, in more detail. All right, so let's talk a little bit about protein as an energy source. So again, protein can be used for energy during times of inadequate carbohydrate intake or total energy intake. Um, either one of those could be a time when um, protein might be called upon to provide energy for the body. So what's unique about amino acids is that these can actually be converted to glucose. So fat cannot be converted to glucose, but amino acids can. It's not an energy um, efficient process for the body. But it would be important um, because when you don't have this adequate carbohydrate intake, and we know that glucose is the preferred um, fuel source for the brain, um, amino acids can be converted to glucose to provide this energy. Um, when this happens, uh, urea is a, is a product of this protein metabolism. It's usually excreted by the body, but if there were a lot of buildup of urea in the body, this could have some negative health implications as well. As mentioned before, protein is not stored in the body. So there's no benefit of overconsuming amino acids. So it's not that you're going to store, have this huge storage component or storage container in your body of protein or amino acids so that when you don't consume enough carbohydrate, you can just call on these. Basically, if you don't have enough carbohydrate, your amino acids are going to be used immediately for that to provide glucose or provide energy. And instead, your protein will not be used, um, you know, to do all those roles that we just talked about. So whether it was providing the structural component or helping with blood clotting or repairing tissue, instead it's going to go towards um, our energy source. So during this time, um, amino acids, the groups will be stripped um, of their surplus amino acids. And again, they'll be used to meet immediate energy needs, make glucose for storage of glycogen, and then make fat for energy storage. So there's Bit of overconsuming um, those amino acids or protein in general. Here you can see um, the, the differences between the macronutrient energy sources. So carbohydrate again, our ring, um, it's providing four calories per gram. Fat, our glycerol backbone and our um, fatty acids, providing nine calories per gram, so very energy dense. And then again, our protein, our difference is that it provides nitrogen. 
um, and it's also providing four calories per gram to provide the same amount of energy per gram as carbohydrates. All right, so what happens to, to amino acids in the body? So once amino acids arrive at the cell, it basically has three fates. So it can either be used to build protein, um, it can be used to make a needed pro or a needed compound, which uh, might be something like a vitamin, um, like niacin would be an example. Or it may be dismantled to use the amine group to build a non-essential amino acid. So again, those essential amino acids provide um, the structure or amino acids needed to build some of those non-essential amino acids. When we have this overconsumption of amino acids, again, there's no benefit of doing that. So basically, amino acids consumed in excess are going to be wasted, and you don't want to waste your amino acids because there's no benefit from this. So there are four conditions in which this may occur. So when there's energy of lacking, lacking from other sources, so if we're not consuming enough um, carbohydrate or total energy intake, and instead of using our amino acids for those important roles of protein, um, you know, we have to use the amino acids for energy instead. If protein is overabundant, again, it's not going to be stored, those amino acids are wasted. If amino acids are oversupplied in supplement form, again, that, that relates back to protein being overabundant, you're just going to excrete it through the body. So that's very expensive um, urine that you're paying for. Or if the quality of the diet diet's protein is too low. So if, um, if an individual is not consuming enough amino acids, um, specifically the essential amino acids, then this can also um, cause wasting of, of our amino acids as a whole. So the dietary um, protein intake must be of adequate quality, so we want those good amino acids, those essential amino acids. We need it to supply those amino acids in the proper amounts, and then we must have adequate intake of carbohydrate and fat, so our other energy-yielding macronutrients, which will also help us have enough energy intake overall.